Thanks, Ria. Uh, keep that passage open, folks, and um, I'm going to just pray one more time before we have a look at it. Let's pray together. Father, these are exciting verses, especially the last ones. And we pray that uh, the joy that is ours in Christ Jesus would be clear for each of us as we um, hear you speak through your word and as your spirit brings it home to us. So be at work in us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Uh, last week at our Easter camp, um, in, in the one house there, there was a bookshelf. And I picked up a book there of uh, short stories. They were alternative or alternate history short stories. Um, kind of a weird form of literature. They, tell, they ask the what-if questions. So what if Hitler never invaded Russia? What would have happened? Or what if uh, Marconi never invented the telephone? I'm trying to think of famous people and my mind's drawing a blank. Um, what if all these things had never happened? What would the world look like then? And this was an interesting book because it had a lot of uh, what-if stories about Christianity. What, if, uh, what would the world look like had Christianity not worked its way through the world, through the centuries as it has? What would be different? And one of those stories had a delegation coming to Bulgaria and the emperor of Bulgaria. One was a delegation from a, a Muslim caliphate and one was a delegation from the Pope, and each of these delegations had to kind of pitch their religion to this emperor of Bulgaria uh, for him to choose what he and his country would, would then follow. And obviously this would have uh, political, economic, etc. Et implications. At the end of the story, the emperor of Bulgaria picks Islam. And the reason he gives for that is because he enjoys the idea of the Muslim heaven more than he does the Christian idea of heaven. And because I read this over Easter, it got me thinking about, I know this is going to sound rather transactional, but, but bear with me. It got me thinking about the core benefit of being a Christian. What does Jesus' death on my behalf actually get for me? And why is this better? Why is this something worth believing in? Why is this something worth hoping for? Why is this something worth living for? Now, the book of Romans, which we're coming back into after a few weeks' break, I think has been helpful for us already in exploring this. Romans is a letter that is a presentation, I guess, of the entire Christian story. It, it shows us the point of what we call the gospel, which means good news. It tells us why we need the gospel why we need Jesus. It tells us what exactly the gospel is. It tells us how the gospel works its way out in our lives. And I think you can boil all that down to a simple statement that says, because of Jesus, we get God. Because of Jesus, we get God. So, in Romans chapters 1 to 4, we, were, we saw that we, by, we are by nature separated from God. Not only that, but we're actually in trouble with God. God is wrathful at humanity. We are his enemies. He is our enemy. Thus, our need for Jesus. Jesus gets, uh, he needs to get us to a place where we can be right with God again. That's called righteousness or justification. And he does that by dying for our wrongdoing, our rebellious hearts, our rebellious nature. And then in turn, he gives us his righteousness. And we saw that last Friday at the Easter camp, if you're there, you remember, we illustrated this by taking a red ribbon, uh, symbolizing our rebellion against God, by nailing it to a cross, saying, there it is, it's, it's, it's done for, it's dealt with, and in turn taking a white ribbon, which symbolized Christ's righteousness, this right standing before God that we are given by Jesus. By believing in Jesus, we are justified. God sees us as justified, as we read there in verse 1. It's an exchange. Now, what do we get when this happens? Now, I've said we get God, and I think it is what these verses that we read for us show us, the first two verses in Romans 5. But I also think it is the trajectory of the Bible story. We saw that in our growth group series, didn't we? God works throughout history to enable us to get Him, to be back with Him. The question for us, 
like it was for that Bulgarian emperor, is, is that what you thought Christianity was about? And is that enough for you? Those are the questions I want us to wrestle with as we go through this text. Is this what I thought Christianity was about? And is this enough for me? So, chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, that's made right with God by faith in the crucified and resurrected Jesus, we have three things. Number one, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have access by faith into the grace in which we stand. And we have hope in the glory of God. Those three are worth exploring. We're going to spend a fair bit of time on them. So here we go. When, when the world was starting to um, be in total fear of, the, the, of nuclear war, late 1950s, you know, the, the big nations were arming up. They were getting nuclear bombs. There was this move uh, against nuclear armament. And one British uh, man, he was a Christian man, actually, he was asked to design a symbol that would represent this movement. And uh, this is what he came up with. You might recognize it. It's become a bit of a fashion statement, but he describes why he did this. He says of the symbol, I was in despair, deep despair, and I drew myself, the representative of an individual in despair with both hands, palm outstretched downwards, like this. And that is what he came up with. Interestingly, this was um, unveiled Easter weekend, 1958. When you see past the fashion statement and you think about what he was talking about, he understood a lot more of what we might think. He understood the fear of war. He understood the fear of death and annihilation and, and the sort of anxiety that comes with uncertainty, the emotional pressure of these things, the emotional anguish of there not being peace. He understood that. Now, when Paul writes in Romans 5 that we have peace with God, he's, the word he's thinking of there is the word shalom. And it describes much more than just putting down guns. It's actually a restoration of friendship and relationship where everything is in harmony and there's no feeling of anguish and fear and despair. It's overwhelmingly positive. In our growth group series last term, we would have used the word rest as something that is similar. And a small glimpse of this idea was seen in 1914. Christmas Eve 1914, World War I had been going for a few months. There would already been hundreds of thousands of men killed in the trenches in Europe. But on Christmas Eve, there was a ceasefire. I don't know if you've heard the story. It was actually quite amazing. All over the battlefield, guys put down their weapons, and they stopped killing each other. But there was more. The French, English, or French, British, and German soldiers actually got up out of the trenches. They walked across no man's land, and they started talking to each other. They shared cigarettes. They shared chocolates. They shared uh, snacks. They sang hymns together. They played football together. They related to one another like humans. There was peace. Not just quiet guns, but relationship. Friendship. That is what you and I have with God when we trust in Jesus. It's not just we're not enemies anymore. It's more we are reconciled, we read in verses 10 and 11. We are friends with God. He's, he's not negative about us anymore, but He's also not just neutral about us. He's positive about you. When you are justified, justified by faith, God likes you. He loves you. He's positively inclined towards you. That is what the entire human race lost when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit. They were kicked out of the garden. We lost that relationship with God. And each of us seeks it. Whether we realize it or not, we look for it in our morality, in our relationships, in our identity and our sexuality more and more, in our dreams and our hopes for ourselves we look for that something bigger, something transcendent, because we know we have this gap, and we want to fill it. Jesus fills the gap. He gives us what we're missing. He gives us what we're lost 
And that is peace with God, a relationship with God. Something we were created for. We have peace. Secondly, we have obtained access by faith in this grace in which we stand. It's been given to us as well. I used to live in Windsor, uh, walking distance from Windsor Castle, and I actually worked just below the castle. And sometimes when I'd uh, been working late, I would be waiting for a taxi and I'd see the Queen drive by. Queen Elizabeth liked to drive herself, so I was never sure who was sitting in the back, whether it was a chauffeur or not, because she'd be sitting there in a, in a big Rolls Royce driving past. But that's as close as I got to her. Uh, there is a chasm, a social chasm between me and Queen Elizabeth, and between you and Queen Elizabeth. Neither of us can go up to her and go, hey, Lizzie, what's cooking? <laughs> Just to clarify, in case you want, I never tried that either, okay? That, that closeness, that access has to be granted to us. You know, you'd have to get an invitation to a function or someone close to the queen would need to welcome you in and say, come with me and we'll get to meet the queen. What's more, with the queen, there are rules of engagement. You can't speak to her first. She has to speak to you first. When you address her, you have to call her your royal, what's its name? I'm not sure if it's majesty or, or highness. You have to bow like this, woman have to curtsy like this. There are things that you have to do when you meet the queen. And that is a very, I guess, small picture of the gap that exists between you and God. You have to be invited in. And, and in reality, there should be massive rules of engagement for us before God. But what Jesus has done is that he's obtained that access for you, the justified one, to stand in the presence of God. I mean, we read that verse, we access to stand, and we think, oh, that's fine, we're standing there. But imagine, I mean, if you've watched any historical shows of how, um, I was actually read something once where when people met Kublai Khan or Genghis Khan, I can't remember which one, they would, if he was sitting in the back by those doors and they walked in here, they wouldn't be allowed to walk in. You would go on your hands and feet from the moment you crossed the threshold of the door with your nose on the floor, and you would crawl all the way up to where he was. You weren't allowed to look at him. You weren't allowed to stand on your knees. You weren't allowed to talk first. There was this massive chasm. You and I, if you have been justified by faith in Jesus Christ, you have the immense privilege of standing in the presence of God. That is the nature of your restored relationship with him. That is the privilege given to the Christian to be back with the God who made you, the God through whom you have life, the God who is the highest ideal, the highest goal, the highest good, the ideal hope. And that's the third thing. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That word rejoice is one that we've seen before. It actually means to, have, to boast or have confidence in. We can have confidence in the glory of God. Justified people can look forward to the day of God's return with a certainty, that's what biblical hope is, a certainty and expectation, a confidence that this is what we are made for and we're going to get it. If you look at the Psalms, I started with Psalm 63, you, you see this desire that the psalmist expresses for more God. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. This always reminds me of Guy Markham. He always used to sing at Christ's PNB. Or... Um, my soul longs for you as the deer pants for the water. There is a desire for more God. It's like putting your vegetables in full sun where they will do best. When we understand that being in God's presence is where we do best, where we flourish, where we shine, then His return, where that shine and that glory will be fully unveiled, is something we look forward to. Like plants that sort of, you ever seen vegetables or plants? They grow towards the sun because they want more of it. We can look forward to and we can have confidence in the return and full revelation of the glory of God where we will grow, where we will flourish. So we have peace, we have access, we have hope because we've been justified through our faith in Jesus Christ. Now there are two questions I wanted us to think about as we were going along. Number one is, is this what I thought? That the result of trusting in Jesus is more God. And is this enough do I sometimes think that oh, there's actually other things I would like to have? Remember those two questions for now. 
keep thinking about them, especially as we tackle the next few verses. So have a look there. And not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions or rejoice in our afflictions. You see that translation has taken that route. Because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. Suffering, not something I like speaking too lightly of, because I feel I, I have not experienced much of it. Paul is different, and we'll hear Paul speak here. Suffering is probably the litmus test of where we have put our hope. What is really important to us? Suffering, which in this case could mean anything from suffering for being a Christian to just going through everyday hardship. Suffering, says Paul, is something that Christians can rejoice in, take confidence in. Not the suffering itself, that would be a bit silly, but the result of it, the outworking of it, because of what it produces in us. And that's because it can actually help us set our hope more firmly in God. For example, if you live for your work, if you are... I don't want to pick on doctors again now when they were spoken so highly of today. Account, uh, lawyers are too easy. Um, if you are, let's say, if you're a sports star, because that's quite often the, the big example here. If you're a sports star and your life is built around your identity as a sports star, imagine Lionel Messi. You know, his last 25 years, he has been one of the greatest soccer players in the history of the world. And that is who he is. And that is, imagine that's taken away from him. Imagine he breaks his leg, he can't play anymore. What's that going to do to him? Who, who's he going to be then? You see it with sports stars because when they have to retire, they suddenly sit there and they go, who, who am I if I'm not a football player or a rugby player? What is my identity? I don't know. And if you think that Christianity is Jesus rescuing you so that you can, with God's help, build your career or, or be the sports star you want to be, and you lose that career, then it's going to call into question in your heart the truth of your faith in your God. I thought I believed in you for this, but I'm not getting it, so are you real? If you think Christianity is about God giving you the things that you want, and He doesn't give you those things, what's that going to do to you? However, if Jesus died and rose again to bring you to God, to earn you peace and assurance and hope with God, then these verses in Romans 5 says suffering is not going to take that away from you. Suffering will not take God away from you. In fact, suffering could be helpful for you in it because suffering leads to perseverance. That word there is single-mindedness. It helps you focus on what is important. And, and we saw this in lockdown, didn't we? Vedette mentioned it in a prayer. Everyone within two weeks of lockdown was going, yo, this is really showing me what's important, and we need to focus on this, this, and this. I think we've forgotten that lesson already. But it did actually help us see what things matter. And this single-mindedness grows um, character in us. It trains us. It's like a soldier who gets through his first skirmish and he becomes more and more experienced. He's proven in battle. And so he becomes, he becomes better at it. He comes to understand what he must and mustn't do. So as we go through suffering and it builds this perseverance in us, it makes us, I don't want to say battle-hardened, but it makes us smarter. It makes us a, a wiser one in it. Especially uh, your character and your confidence in God if you turn to Him for closeness every time you suffer. That grows as you train yourself whenever you go through hard times, to turn to Him and also to, um, I guess as Sam was telling us, to see how He pulls you through those hard times as well. And that produces hope. I think suffering helps us to see where our confidence is. And if we wish for our confidence to be in God, suffering will help remove rival claims. This is a very light, not light-hearted, but light in the scheme of things. As we were praying earlier, 
I also know, I know there are people here who are, who are experiencing real hardship, but I don't want to pick on you for it. I just want to illustrate something, and I'll pick on myself here for the, for the moment. As I've been reading through this, um, I've been thinking about the last few weeks, I'm realizing at the moment that I'm putting my hope, not necessarily in security and safety, but in comfort. My, my ideal at the moment is to live a comfortable life. And, and with all our power, we've had tons of power outages and stuff. We've had water issues. There's potholes. There's all this stuff that really, it really winds me up. It really gets to me. I feel personally affronted by it. And it might sound like I'm overstating, but, but that is my heart at the moment. I, I get offended. And I've been thinking this week, why do I get so offended by this? It's because my hope is comfort. And all these things happening are taking my comfort away. And perhaps I actually need to rejoice in these hardships because God is saying to me, well, hold on a second here, my boy. Your ultimate goal is not your comfort in this life. Your ultimate goal is me. And because I love you, I'm going to let you struggle a bit here with these things because I don't want you to fall down the trap of saying this is all that life is about. So, so that is why suffering can sometimes help us cast aside the things that are blocking our way or blocking our vision of God. And God might be saying, as I think he's saying to me, you're setting your sight so low. I'm what you really want. And, and I want to get to a point where I want to say, if I had God and I lived in a city with no power and no water and no toilets and no nothing, and I still had God, that'd be more than I needed. Suffering produces hope, because the more I see that God is all I need, the more I realize God cannot be taken away from me even when I suffer. If there is a financial meltdown, I lose all my wealth, I still have God. If my health fails, I still have God. If I lose my loved ones, I still have God. If I never accomplish my dream that some of you experienced last week of becoming a world-renowned karaoke singer, I will still have God. And so this is a hope that will never let me down, will never be taken away. I read a story this week about a a Soviet, I guess, enforcer. And he and his team were sent out back in the 70s and 80s, not sure when it was, to, to hunt down Christians. Their job was literally to find church meetings or prayer meetings and disperse them by all means necessary. And he tells the story of bursting in on one meeting and there was a young woman in the meeting. Her name was Natasha, they found out later. And he proceeded to beat Natasha and she ran away. And the very next time he and his team got to another prayer meeting, he was astounded to see Natasha there again. And he was so enraged by her that he grabbed her and he beat her so that he said her back, lower back was a pulp and a bloody mess. And he left her. And the next time he and his team burst into another prayer meeting, there was Natasha again. And he, he saw one of his colleagues go to beat her up again. And he threw himself in front of Natasha. And he said to his colleague, stop. She has something we don't have. Leave her alone. Her name was Natasha. They could take away her freedom. They could take away her dignity, which they did. But she had God, and for her, that was enough. And there's a question we need to ask ourselves again. Is God enough? For that Bulgarian emperor in my stupid story, it wasn't. For him, the idea of an eternity rejoicing in God and God's presence and a life restored to fullness with God wasn't enough. For Natasha, it was. Is this what we want from Jesus? Is this what you want as you say, I believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins? Do you want God? Because that, friends, is what his death has given you.
But there's one question I think we should still be asking, though. If suffering tends to peel back the things we value and put our hope in, how do you know, how do I know for certain that we don't lose God in that suffering? How do I know suffering doesn't mean God is punishing me or has turned against me? And we get the answer in those beautiful last verses of our section. And there's two, two, two ways we can see this. The first is a subjective reality. Have a look at verse 5. And hope will not disappoint us or put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The subjective reality is that when you are justified, when you put your trust in Jesus, God pours His love into your heart through the Spirit. Now that's a flood. It's not a trickle. It's not a thimbleful. He pours out His love into your heart. And this happens when you believe. And it often, when most needed, will happen at times again. I'm not talking about what some folks might call a second baptism, but more a filling of the Spirit when it is required. I sometimes come here on Sundays feeling spiritually dry. And often I will have that pouring out when I hear uh, one of our prayers. Or when we sing a song that is just powerful and God works through it. When, we, when, um, when I hear a sermon, either on a Sunday or through the week, it's one of those reminders that God gives us that goes, you're mine. I love you. You're mine. And they're fantastic. They're lovely, lovely reminders for us. But they are subjective. And sometimes those subjective emotions are few and far between. And then we have to rest on an objective truth and reality. And in verses 6 to 11, Paul uses the objective truth of the cross to encourage us as Christians to see that God is never going to change his mind about you. He's never going to throw his hands up in despair and turn his back on you. So look at verses 6 to 8. For while we were still helpless or weak or powerless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Uh, That word there is wicked. Christ died for the wicked. For one will scarcely die... For a just person, though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We were weak or powerless, we were ungodly or wicked, we were sinners. And Paul says to us in that argument, he says, look, you might die for someone you think is an upright person. You might. You're more likely to give your life for someone who is kind and good and loving. That does happen. It is highly unlikely that any of us is going to lay down our life for someone who hates us or is indifferent towards us or who is wicked. But that is what Jesus did for you, for me. While we were still sinners, while we were ungodly, Christ died for you. And what does that show? Or the word is actually prove or demonstrate it demonstrates that God loves you. Objective, real proof. In my hardships, when I'm tempted to think God doesn't love me, where do I go? I go to the cross. That's where he demonstrated his love for me. And and I guess to, to say it a different way, he demonstrated his commitment to me. And the argument goes on to say, since God did this for you while you were his enemy, how much more now that you are justified, now that you are right with him, is he not going to save you at the end? Where save is his future focus. If he did this for you while you were not his friend, now that you're his friend, what makes you think he's not going to finish the job for you? What makes you think he's going to let you go or turn his back on you? now that you are his. Of course he's not. When we understand that because we are justified, we have God, then we too will understand that if God went through all of that, the agony of the cross, the death of his son for you and me, why is he now going to let go of one of his children? It's just not possible. It's not possible for him to do that. The cross is the objective assurance of God's love for you. And the cross is the objective assurance of your future hope and your certain future. And my life struggles, your life struggles, your life's hardships, your suffering even, will not change those two things. 
Because we are justified, we have God. We have certainty. And in these verses, Paul says we have confidence or joy in that, even if we should suffer. Is that enough? Can I rejoice in God through my Lord Jesus Christ, like verse 11 says? When you feel like you can't, go back to that first line of chapter 5 and its implications. Go back to the cross. Since we have been justified by faith. I am justified by my faith or by faith in the crucified and resurrected Jesus. And when my past haunts me, I don't have to say, oh, what a loser and how terrible and woe is me. I can say, look at me. I'm a Christian. Despite everything that I did, God has done this for me. Wow, isn't he amazing? When when I go through hardship, it doesn't show that God's deserted me or doesn't love me because look at what he went through for me. Why is he going to leave me alone now? I am his loved child. My future is guaranteed even in the midst of this. I don't have to worry about that. And when I wonder whether this is enough, what does my justification mean? It means that what Adam and Eve lost back in the garden, God has given back to me through Jesus Christ. I am His. He is mine. Here is where I belong. I was made for God, and I am His through my Lord Jesus Christ. I would love for you to just take a few moments and speak to God. Think through these things. Confess both when this hasn't been enough, but also be assured, take heart, say thank you, For the fact that in Jesus Christ, your future, your present is guaranteed. And while you pray and speak to God yourself, I'm going to just ask the music team to come up. And they will respond for us, or we will sing together in song as we rejoice in what Christ has done for us.